Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Mark Duggan, the director of CEPR, which is the Stanford Institute for Economic Policy Research. And I'm delighted that so many of you are able to join us online today for our first virtual associates meeting. It looks like we have a huge turnout, 1,034 at last count. And I know that we're all very interested in today's topic in which we'll cover the coronavirus pandemic and US health policy with three incredibly knowledgeable panelists. Even though we may all be getting more used to virtual events and meetings like this one, it still feels a bit unusual. I'm therefore looking forward to hopefully seeing you in person soon. Uh, as trying and difficult as this pandemic has been on all of us and literally the entire world, this has also been a time for CEPR to live up to our core missions of supporting economic policy relevant research, sharing it broadly, and bringing together key leaders in the academic, business, policy, and philanthropic worlds. CEPR researchers have been producing working papers and policy briefs at a rapid rate during these past few weeks in response to the pandemic's health effects and the economic fallout. And many of them are frequently being featured in news articles about the crisis. We're showcasing all of that output on our website, and I encourage you to visit our homepage to see what our experts have been saying about everything from the way financial markets have been moving to the benefits and costs of having so many people around the world work from home. I'm grateful to so many of you for supporting us and for being a part of our community. And for those of you who are new to CEPR today, welcome. And again, I'm thrilled that you're with us for today's event. There's so much that we could talk about when it comes to the, comes to the pandemic's impact on US healthcare and the policy response. And we're going to zero in on a few key slices of this in the next hour. I'm hoping that we can all walk away from today's event with a sense for some of the areas where policy has been working well and where it has not been uh, working so well. We'll first be hearing from Drew Altman, who is the president and CEO of the Henry J. Kaiser Family Foundation. Drew is an innovator in the world of foundations and nonprofits and is a leading expert on national health policy. Today, Drew will be discussing some of the extensive polling that the Kaiser Family Foundation has done on the pandemic and the federal government's role relative to state and local governments in the overall response. After Drew, we'll hear from Kate Bundor. Kate is one of our senior fellows at CEPR and is, a, is an associate professor of health research and policy at the Stanford School of Medicine. She's also an associate professor by courtesy at Stanford's Graduate School of Business and is a Stanford Health Policy Fellow. Much of Kate's research focuses on health insurance markets and she'll be talking about the effect of the huge increase in unemployment on health insurance coverage while also considering how COVID is affecting overall healthcare spending and the associated challenges for hospital finances. Following Kate, Kevin Schulman is going to weigh in on the need to digitize the healthcare system to reduce the need for in-person contact between providers and patients. He'll talk about how that sort of revolution can improve patient care, create substantial efficiencies, and potentially help us to emerge from this crisis. Kevin is a professor of medicine at the Stanford School of Medicine. He's also the Associate Chair of Business Development and Strategy in the Department of Medicine and the Director of Industry Partnerships and Education for the Clinical Excellence Research Center at Stanford. Kevin's research focuses on organizational innovation in healthcare, healthcare policy, and health economics. After their introductory presentations, I will moderate a Q&A session with Drew, Kate, and Kevin. If you had registered for this event, you'll be able to submit a question through the link you received in your confirmation email. And if you're just joining us without having registered, you can email your questions to the email address that's listed below on the screen, jmhuber at stanford.edu. Again, thanks so much to all of, all of you for joining us today for CEPR's first virtual event. And with that, I'll turn things over to Drew Altman from the Kaiser Family Foundation. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Hey, everyone. Um, happy to be with you. I'm actually coming to you from the middle of nowhere in the Santa Cruz Mountains. And I'm always happy to do another um, Zoom call because just fortuitously, we own a bunch of Zoom stock at KFF. So we're all for more Zoom calls. I just do want to make sure you all know that KFF is an endowed nonprofit health policy organization, which I started in the, I guess it was the early 1990s. And we have no connection at all to Kaiser Permanente. Uh, it's a sensitive issue for us. So say it with me, no connection <laughs> to Kaiser Permanente. I actually wanna start at 60,000 feet and I wanna talk about the 
general structure and theory really of the federal response and its implications. And this is this idea that I'm sure you've heard about many times every afternoon about the federal government as backup to the states, uh, which I think has strengths, but also many more glaring weaknesses. And um, if you'll allow me, I just wanna begin for uh, a second with a little bit of a personal story about my own state government experience to set up a broader point, uh, which I wanna make. And it's the story of my first day on the job as commissioner of human services in the state of New Jersey. And the problem I had was I couldn't find the job. I'd never been to Trenton, New Jersey. There's really no reason to go to Trenton, New Jersey if you've never been there. So I bumbled around, I found a guard and I was very young. And he said, kid, it's in that building, it's in that building. And I said, but there's no sign there. And finally I talked my way up to the 11th floor and I went in and I had my big idea. And so I met everyone and said, you know, we're the large, we were then the largest organization in the state of New Jersey, even bigger than the drug companies, a third of the state budget, a third of the state workforce. I'm sure we're very proud of what we do. Why don't we have a sign? There will be a sign in front of this building. Well, nine months later, after the job uh, of putting up a sign was stopped because the wrong procurement rules were used and then stopped again because the wrong union happened to work on the job and then stopped again by through a wonderful letter from the State Department of Treasury, which literally said this job should not go forward because it is too small to do. It was my birthday. There were newspaper stories. Will Commissioner Altman get his sign? They called me down to the front of the building. There were a thousand people there and a huge hundred foot uh, sheet draped across the front of the building and they peeled it back. And there it was, the New Jersey State Department of Hunan Services. They spelled it wrong. So we were laggards on signs. Uh, I think we were pace setters on many other things. And that's what you will see from the states on COVID-19. You'll see a bunch of pace setters. You know, you can think of Cuomo and Newsom and Inslee and certainly DeWine in Ohio. Um, but you'll also see laggards. Just think of the South or even resistors. Think of Georgia. I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about Georgia. And then there will be a big muddled middle. Uh, there also are painful uh, red state and blue state uh, differences, which I'm sure you're observing. So I'm a huge fan um, of the states, but that is in my decades of experience at the state and federal level, always what you get when you leave discretion to the states without clear federal leadership and metrics. It's just that it's magnified here because the stakes of the epidemic are so, so big people's lives, really. Uh, and you're going to see it in every area. You'll see it in testing. You'll see it in tracing, which I think is the next frontier. We should talk about it. You'll see, in critical, see it in critical supplies, from ventilators to PPE, and, and you'll see it in much more. Um, I think it's obvious that this is driven by the president's desire to avoid responsibility for the epidemic for the election and dump it on the governors. But that really isn't my uh, point uh, right now. The point instead is just that uh, this approach to the epidemic has huge implications for policy and for public health, and we see it every day. It also leaves um, uh, employers essentially on their own to tackle a mind-boggling array of challenges. I know I am an employer, and in some states, and we don't talk about this enough, there will be challenges as well for cities and for counties. Uh, for example, Atlanta's gonna do what it can not to do what Georgia is doing, um, despite the governor saying they have to do it. Most of the mayors in the big cities in Texas are democratic mayors. They're not gonna wanna do what Texas does and so on. So that's just the first point. I think it's an overarching issue. The, the, the nature and the structure of the federal response has lots of big implications. Uh, meanwhile, and the second thing I wanna talk about, the response we're seeing from the public to this epidemic, I, I think has been surprising. It's been remarkable. These data are a little bit old, the very end of March, but then 82% of the American people reported that they were sheltering in place, 89 to 95% reported uh, social distancing, all the behaviors that we're all saying that people should do. And that's across every age group. So you see the young people on TV on spring break at the beach, they were at the beach, 
but they're also not representative of young people generally. I think the issues are how consistently are people social distancing and how long can they keep keep it up? And we're finding that out now and we'll know more in a new survey today or tomorrow. The public overwhelmingly has been prioritizing the virus over opening up the economy. Uh, in that last survey, it was 80%, 14%, and that's despite the liberate marches that you see on TV. Yesterday's was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. We will see if that changes in the survey tomorrow or the next day, especially for Republicans. So that's a little bit of an alert. Stay tuned for that. I just want to make two comments on policy issues. I was going to talk about the election, but I think I'll, I'll stop there. Um, one is, as I think you know, the Congress has waived testing costs, sort of. People still have to submit out-of-pocket costs, and that could be a daunting thing to do, and not everyone can run that gauntlet. The next step. I think, is to waive treatment costs, uh, though there doesn't seem to be a great deal of energy around that. But the median cost of ventilator support for 96 hours in hospital is $88,000. It's $20,000 for pneumonia with complications. And the out-of-pocket cost for either of those is around $1,300. So quite obviously, those costs can be devastating for many people in this economy. They can be a cause for people to avoid care. So I think that's a really important issue. And then just the last issue I wanna bring up, and uh, we can talk about the election later if you want to. Um, there has been, I would say, understandable controversy over the $100 billion hospital bailout program, the first hospital bailout program. Uh, that is because it has been based on past Medicare payments to hospitals and not their COVID burden. So for example, a Minnesota hospital with a light burden would get around $300,000 per COVID case. And a New York hospital with a very heavy COVID burden, we get around $12,000 from a New Jersey hospital, about $18,000. And it's also true that as much as, may not be this much, but as much as 40% of that program will go to pay for hospital care for the uninsured with COVID, which was not the original purpose. Um, of the program. Um, and that's because they did not, as you know, want to have a special ACA enrollment period for the uninsured. They are adding to the program this week to help hospitals who are losing revenues because uh, they have not been doing elective procedures. And I think Kate will talk about that, as well as another big issue we've all been thinking about a lot, which is what does this all mean for healthcare spending and healthcare costs? So I will stop there um, on behalf of the New Jersey Department of Hunan Services and KFF, which is not affiliated with Kaiser Permanente. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Drew, for uh, those insightful remarks. And with that, I will uh, next up is Kate Bundor from Stanford. Okay, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Drew, for those uh, um, insightful comments and insights. I thought I would spend my time talking a little bit about the effects of the COVID pandemic on two things. First, I want to think about insurance coverage, and then I also want to think a little bit about healthcare spending and then point out what I think are the key policy issues in both of these areas. So let's start with insurance coverage. So I think it, as many people know, employment is really the backbone of our system of health insurance for the working age population. So when people lose their job, they often lose their health insurance. So they really ha have you know, kind of twin problems. They suffer a big income loss. Unemployment insurance helps with that, but they also suffer, suffer a health insurance loss and unemployment insurance doesn't really directly address that. So in taking from the recent past and the Great Recession at the end of the 2000s, um, the unemployment rate peaked at 10% and over 9 million people, according to estimates from economists, lost their employer-sponsored health insurance. So this coming economic downturn is a little bit different. And I think as you know, many people have seen from you know, now the you know, kind of famous New York Times um, uh, picture of unemployment claims, one issue has just been the speed of the job loss and the other is the magnitude, right? So we saw a very sharp increase in the number of people losing their jobs in a very short period of time. We don't really know the, um, what the uh, ultimate effect on unemployment will be. Some people are, are um, forecasting 15%, others maybe 20% in the second quarter. 
Um, either way, it seems like unemployment uh, will be higher. The rate of unemployment will be higher than it was in the last recession. How long will that last? Uh, we don't really know. One thing that is different in a positive way from our last recession is that we now have a much more comprehensive safety net than we used to. This is because of the Affordable Care Act. The Affordable Care Act essentially put into place a system of subsidies for health insurance related to your income. So as your income declines, you become eligible for bigger subsidies for health insurance. So this starts out with met for very low income people, folks have access to Medicaid. Um, Medicaid is essentially fully subsidized. And then as folks income increases, they have access for to subsidized private health insurance through, through the ACA exchanges. And this really serves people kind of in the middle of the income distribution. Um, the subsidies decline in income um, in the sense that the subsidies get smaller as your income gets bigger. And it turns out that unemployment benefits actually count toward the income uh, that is used to determine the subsidies. At the higher end of the income spectrum, uh, folks who have family incomes or household incomes greater than 400% of poverty, uh, there are no subsidies and folks buy health insurance in highly regulated markets. Okay, so that's the outline of the system that we have. Right now, I think there are, are three problems that I wanna focus on. So the first one is we have 14 states that did not expand Medicaid coverage, right? So that's obviously well known in, in policy circles. Uh, this is an important issue because we have a very large group of low income people who have no health insurance. And COVID has really exacerbated the risks associated with uninsurance. And you can think of this in two ways. First, you can think about the cost of COVID related care that Drew was just talking about. Uh, people uh, face a huge financial risk if they contract COVID and they need expensive care. We can also think about um, the potential for medical care um, uh, or lack thereof to contribute to the spread of disease, right? So if people people need health insurance, they need access to health care in order to get access to the appropriate advice and um, get information on uh, diagnosis, testing, and treatment for COVID. Um, that helps their own health, you know, as well as the health of others. The second problem in states that didn't expand Medicaid is that it creates this gaping hole in the safety net for people who lose their uh, jobs and that reduces their income substantially. So the point here is that in states that expanded Medicaid, Medicaid if your income declines dramatically, uh, you can enroll in Medicaid coverage. And in states that didn't, uh, uh, folks don't have that, that safety net. The next issue, which I think is important is, uh, is we're going to be having a huge, or we already are having a huge influx of lower income people who are newly eligible for either Medicaid or exchange coverage. And we really have to think about the capacity of the system to process and enroll those people in a timely manner. Exchanges have special procedures and special eligibility for people who, who have lost their coverage uh, because they lost their health insurance, but that can be kind of complicated, right? So we wanna make sure that people can get through that, um, that in a timely way. We also have a set of people who didn't have health insurance private to COVID and may be newly motivated or newly interested in obtaining it now to you know, either protect themselves or um, other people to think about the, um, you know, the contagious nature of the disease and the effects on society. Medicaid is pretty flexible. People can enroll if they qualify at any time. Um, however, in 2019, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that about 23% of the uninsured were eligible for coverage in an exchange and didn't enroll. Exchanges have special periods during the year, open enrollment, in which people can enroll in coverage. If you don't already have health insurance and now you want to buy it through an exchange, um, you won't necessarily qualify for a special enrollment period. You won't be able to buy it in an exchange, and that is um, attention as well. So when we think about health insurance, there are really th three things that we really need to be focused on. What are we going to do for the people who are low income in states that have not expanded their Medicaid programs? We need to make sure, or and if it's not working out, figure out how to enroll people who are eligible more quickly and efficiently. And then, you know, as Drew alluded to, we really want to think about making exceptions to enroll, enroll currently uninsured people into exchanges. Okay, so now I'll talk a little bit about healthcare spending. Um, there have been interesting things happening with healthcare spending in the U.S., and I think the you know kind of the big picture question is how will this pandemic affect um, healthcare spending uh, in the U.S. 
And to really think about that problem, you have to think about two offsetting effects. So one is the effect of uh, on healthcare spending of people who are infected with the disease and people who need uh, COVID-related care. The other thing that is emerging as you know potentially equally or even more important is the an potential offsetting effect on healthcare of healthcare utilization of non-COVID-related healthcare use. Right, so what's happening to the healthcare use of people who um, you know, need to be treated for other diseases, um, but aren't actually um, uh, infected with the COVID virus. So, so let's kind of start with the first one. Let's think a little bit about COVID related care. So if you have a very serious um, uh, case of COVID, as Drew talked about, healthcare is very expensive. But the issue here is that there are at the population level, there are relatively few people who are in that position, right? So, uh, for those of you who've been following, um, you know, some of the uh, you know the data gathering exercises for COVID, you know, currently we're really kind of arguing over the prevalence of the infection in this in the country as a whole. We're trying to figure out how many people have been infected with the COVID uh, virus, and the numbers that we're talking about right now are one percent, you know, to maybe four percent. We you know start just emerging data are starting to emerge on this issue. But when you think about those costs for the one or say 4% of the population, even though each person could be potentially expensive, a subset of those people are gonna go on to expensive care, relative to the magnitude of healthcare spending in our system of the, as a whole, um, that's pretty small. The other thing that's happening is that many of the people who have the most severe cases of COVID, at least right now, and based on the data that we have so far, are older people, and those people are covered by Medicare. So it looks like, at least from our preliminary numbers, that Medicare is going to end up covering at least a lot of this initial COVID-related care. So the offsetting issue is this is potentially a very large reduction in non-COVID related care. This is really difficult to measure on a widespread scale right now, but we have lots of um, anecdotal reports that non-COVID related care is declining. And so why is that? So for some providers, the cause is the steps that they took for planning uh, for the COVID related surge, right? So they eliminated elective services, um, you know, to make room for COVID patients and have the resources available for those patients. But anecdotal reports are suggesting that the volume for lots of different types of services have actually declined. And that raises important questions. Where are the hospitalizations for heart attacks and strokes? You know, very important um, uh, medical treatment for very serious conditions. So that is um, a bit of a puzzle, but is leading to lower rates of healthcare use. Other types of providers are, are really kind of suffering financially for many of the same reasons that businesses like restaurants and you know, uh, hair salons are, 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 are suffering financially. People are simply not buying their services, whether it's a lack of demand, pa patients are worried about contracting the virus or shelter in place policies that pr prohibit um, uh, providers from uh, providing the particular types of services. This is really threatening the financial um, viability of a broad set of medical care providers. And the underlying issue here is that most of, in most of our healthcare economy, providers get paid for delivering services. They get paid fee for service. Um, so a small number of providers have experienced catastrophic volume. You can think of hospitals in New York, but a large set are really facing the opposite problem. They're, they're really just not providing enough services to make their organizations or their practices uh, financially sustainable. So when we think about this to us of setting effects, you know, it's hard to know which one will um, uh, you know, which one will be larger, but I, I think at least in the, in the short run, um, I suspect that the increase in COVID-related uh, utilization is going to be smaller and potentially much smaller than the reduction in services that we're, gonna, that we're seeing for non-COVID-related patients. So the bigger problem, you know, we worried a lot about the cost of COVID-related care, but a bigger problem that we might want to think about is kind of the lack of healthcare spending. You know, as we've seen in the news, we need tests, we need treatments, we need PPE for healthcare providers. Those things are expensive, but they certainly seem to be worth it at this point. Um, we also need to think about uh, how to start or um, ensure we're providing the right care to non-COVID related, uh, non-COVID patients who really need those services. There's a big concern that uh, many people are foregoing very important uh, treatments that are very beneficial for their health. Okay, so what does this mean for policy? What do we need to do? 
Um, there are a few things. First, we really need to make sure that we have the right incentives to promote the innovation and use of services that we need for the pandemic, right? So we need, really need to think about surge capacity uh, for hospitals and providers. And we also need to think about how hospitals can treat both COVID and non-COVID patients in a sustainable manner. So I think a good example of a policy change in this area was Medicare's increase in the payment rate uh, for COVID-related testing, as well as the relaxation of rules around paying for telehealth visits. You know, both of those things, um, especially the latter, have really been game changers. We also need to think pretty hard about how to address the temporary financial difficulties facing healthcare providers due to shelter in place. You know, once again, this is similar to many of the issues you know facing other businesses in the in our economy. Um, but we really need to think about um, how to support providers uh, during this time. Uh, we need to reintegrate patients into the healthcare system. Uh, we think that um, some patients are foregoing needed care, and you know we need to address that hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. And then, you know, finally, if we think out into kind of the future and, and into our post-COVID world, um, we really need to like, think about all the valuable innovation that has emerged as providers have really learned uh, how to do more with less, right? So we can think about televisits, we can think about switching from injectables to oral therapies, the things that hospitals and other healthcare providers um, have adopted in the face of this, you know, really a, a health crisis and figure out which one of these, you know, kind of cost reducing technologies uh, we, can, uh, we can disseminate more widely over the long term and how can we create payment systems that really reward uh, um, hospitals and providers for this type of cost reducing behavior that may actually improve the quality and the effectiveness of care. I think I'll end with that, uh, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much, Kate. And I think that's a perfect uh, transition uh, for Kevin Schulman. So he's next up and also from Stanford. Great. Well, thank, thanks, Mark. And uh, actually, it was a great transition. So um, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the positive side of this. What are we learning uh, in real time about ways in which we can change the practice of medicine uh, and how and just to demonstrate how substantial that change was in such a short period of time. So Kate talked a little bit about telemedicine or televisits. Um, you know, this has been a debate for more than two decades about whether or not we could move to a world where you see remote visits with your physicians um, or with your clinicians. Um, you know, we do this, uh, uh, you know, I email my lawyer. Uh, most of the world takes place, all the services I get, a lot of them take place remotely. A lot of times I never see the person uh, in uh, uh, the provider in person, uh, but at least in, in those uh, realms, I have a choice. In healthcare, we've never had a choice. If you want to come and see the doctor, you have to come, you have to pay for parking, uh, you have to take half of your day off, uh, wait in a clinic, crowded waiting room, uh, and finally see someone for 10, 15 minutes uh, where we tell you, you know what, you had to schedule another visit, you have to do some prevention. Uh, and so it's not obviously very patient centric. Uh, so at the beginning of COVID, uh, Stanford's uh, Express Care uh, moved from eight uh, video visits a day to 150 video visits a day uh, for COVID-19 screening. And that was, uh, you know, over a really short period of time. A lot of that got done over a weekend. Across all of Stanford healthcare, we're now seeing about 16,000 televisits a week with about 1,400 uh, different providers that are on the system. Uh, again, from from you know, really next to nothing at the beginning of all this. Uh, we've been able to turn this on and pretty dramatically change the way we do business. You know, uh, across the country, Teladoc, a public company that reports uh, they're doing 20,000 virtual visits a day, almost double the number of virtual visits uh, that they had from the first week of March. So it's not just Stanford, and we're hearing ideas about uh, televisits uh, all across the country. How did this happen? Well, one of the ways in which this happened uh, as Medicare made some changes to policy, especially removing restriction, geographic restrictions in the Medicare fee-for-service program um, for, uh, for televisits. Uh, they made some changes to the payment rates and payment for check-in calls. Uh, they're continuing to expand uh, those kinds of services and uh, the definition of services. There was just new, uh, new rules out on March 30th. Um, but the other thing that held us back was this whole concern for forever that if I did a video chat or a text message with my patient, 
uh, that I'd run afoul of HIPAA, the Health Insurance Portability uh, uh, Act, which governs patient privacy and security in digital in the digital world. If you think about HIPAA, HIPAA was put in place in 1996. You know, it sounds like forever ago. When you think about what concerns people would have about digital technology in those days, uh, so what HHS did is uh, announced that they were going to use their enforcement discretion uh, and and forego HIPAA enforcement for technologies that are used in telemedicine visits, such as FaceTime uh, or Zoom. Unfortunately, Zoom is blowing up in terms of security as we're doing this. Uh, but FaceTime has as much or more security than anything else. They just haven't bothered uh, to go through the HIPAA compliance process. You know, as we looked at this, uh, we just published a, a little paper on this with Serena Casira and Andrea jo uh, Andrea Jones, uh, Stanford. Um, you know, this is still not a transition to digital medicine. I mean, we went from in-person visits to virtual visits, but we still haven't unleashed the full armamentarium of digital tools that we could think about it could be really useful for COVID. Uh, so we talked about the need for new payment models for things like hospital at home. So if you're seen in the emergency room with COVID, I send you home with monitoring uh, equipment and so you don't bring COVID in to expose the staff at the hospital. I could see you virtually every day through a remote monitoring service. I could have the same kind of monitors at home that we do in the hospital. If we need to send people out, we can. Um, and in fact, uh, in Australia, these kinds of models are 80% less, uh, cost about 80% as much or 20% less uh, than the bricks and mortar version, and yet we don't really have those payment models here. Again, this is something that's been talked about for a long time, and it's something we could easily turn on uh, now with all the uh, technology we have. In a different direction, Kate talked about all the people who aren't coming in for care. Well, they're not coming in for care because they're scared of getting COVID, and they're gonna continue to be scared of getting COVID for the next two years, uh, until uh, until the vaccine uh, is available. Uh, and so what are the other things that we could be doing to take care of patients remotely? Uh, and we have uh, a really fun case we did at the business school about Amazon Alexa do, and uh, using that for population health. Um, and obviously Google and Facebook, uh, both, have, I'm sorry, Google and Apple both have tools like this. Um, but you can imagine writing scripts to help take care of patients with diabetes using one of these uh, voice assistants. Um, and uh, again, these payment models still aren't in place, but are a huge opportunity for us to experiment with. On the back end of all this, uh, and Kate's kind of alluding to this a little bit in her talk, um, is the business model of healthcare is based in relatively fixed infrastructure. We own at Stanford a lots of buildings. Um, we want patients to come back to those buildings. Uh, we are not gonna wanna go back to this, you know, to this virtual or stay in this virtual world if we have a chance to go back. And so there's gonna be real pressure, uh, both here and elsewhere around the country to go back to the old business model, the old way of doing healthcare. Now patients after a year of, of doing virtual visits with their doctor are not gonna like coming back and paying for parking again. Uh, and so they may move from Stanford to one medical that's actually closed most of their offices and moved almost purely to virtual visits. Uh, but one of the things that we need to do now is to evaluate both the cost and quality impacts of these changes so that at the end of this, when there is this pushback and pressure to say, let's, let's go back to the way things were, we'd have some evidence uh, to support the changes. Now, beyond telemedicine, um, we've had some pretty significant shortcomings that uh, aren't as clear to the rest of the population. With Nigam Shah and Dick Schenker and uh, teams of uh, uh, PhD students across Stanford, we've had uh, to model what's going to happen uh, as a result of the COVID epidemic to our capacity to take care, as Kate talked about, of surges. What's going to happen to our capacity? Do we have the capacity to take care of COVID patients uh, before, in the days before social distancing? Do we have enough uh, personal protective equipment? Um, when a patient, when we first, uh, when I, the last time I rounded at the hospital, when we got a patient who we thought had COVID, we'd send the emergency room would send off a test then we'd have to watch them for a couple of days until the test came back. So there are huge data lags uh, between testing and our understanding whether or not the person was infected. We used a lot of PPE in that time. We also kept a lot of people in the hospital and may not have needed to have been there. Uh, but it also meant that our tools, our electronic health record tools weren't that reliable to even to get a list of how many patients that we have in the hospital that had COVID took a whole team of engineering students 
uh, more than a week. So we began to get feeds, a week or two, I should say, to begin to get daily feeds of what our census was. Um, the idea of building dashboards about the impact of the epidemic uh, was a critical factor both for Stanford Hospital, uh, but it became a factor for Santa Clara County, uh, where uh, different hospitals were having uh, different parts of, uh, seeing different uh, phases of the epidemic, uh, and the question of whether or not we could share resources even within the county, uh, and also became a question about the role of the county in terms of coordinating not the public health sector, but the private health sector. Uh, so uh, Drew talked a little bit about the relationship between federal government and states. There's also a relationship between the public health sector and the private health sector. Uh, and then finally, trying to understand the capacity for surge and overflow. Uh, and this becomes important as we think about the next phase uh, of the epidemic. So the third kind of point I want to bring forward is kind of how we're going to use digital tools and digital technologies uh, to get us out of here. Uh, so uh, social distancing is a way of reducing the spread of, of a viral infection. Um, and uh, it's a pretty dramatic way to reduce the spread. There might be other ways to reduce the spread. Uh, we've talked about already using masks uh, at a population level to try and reduce the spread. We don't know the ev efficacy of that yet. Uh, there might be work policies. Maybe uh, some of us could go back to work and not others. Some of us could work virtually, not others. Uh, should we screen people at the workplace? Uh, and how would we use screening technology in relationship to all that? So just uh, probably about a little over a week ago, uh, Google, uh, maybe two weeks ago now, Google came up with uh, an idea of what this might look like with their community mobility report uh, that uh, one of our fellows and I uh, reviewed. And this is actually is looking at cell phone data for pay, from uh, opt-in uh, people from across 131 countries and then measured things like uh, travel to workplaces, travel to transit stations, grocery stores, retail locations, uh, and residential locations, and was able to ma track mobility changes over the last month. Uh, and with only a day or two lag. Uh, and so as we relax social distancing, tools like this will help us understand what is the behavior of the population out there, kind of to correlate with Drew's idea of the survey data that's starting to come in. And finally, Apple and Google now say that they're building a Bluetooth features uh, to allow us to use our cell phones for contact tracing. And what this means is if uh, coming out of this, we're going to try and understand where there are hotspots, where there's spread, where there are groups of the population that uh, are active COVID cases that need to be quarantined, uh, can we use technology to help us in that, in that regard? Uh, There's a nice paper uh, out of uh, uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Charlie Baker has gone and hired uh, armies of people to do contract tracing. It's a really, really tough job. Uh, the public health department at UCSF is doing this up in San Francisco. Uh, one of our friends is uh, very involved in training uh, up there, and it's really kind of laborious work to ask people, where have you been for the last couple of days, so we could try and find out who you've been in contact with. If technology can help us with that, it might give us another tool in relatively real time uh, to try and figure out what we can reopen and reopen safely. Uh, and then I want to just finally talk about where we're at going forward, uh, is thinking about how to bring this all together in policy discussions about what are approaches that we could use to reopen the economy uh, and across three domains. What would happen to the spread of the virus and the epidemiology as far as we know? What would happen to the economics? Um, and in fact, you know, one of the criticisms of some of these ideas about, well, if we, if we open up again and we tell employers to go rehire their workers, but then we have an outbreak, we're gonna shut them down again. Well, how many employers actually really wanna enter into that? How many people wanna now that they're getting their checks for unemployment, actually want to go back into a relatively uncertain job market. Uh, and then finally, how is this effect, uh, uh, is this going to affect healthcare? We talked a lot about our capacity as healthcare providers uh, to be available for surges. Um, and, uh, but that's uh, generally there's a two week lag between an infection and need for ICU bed. So we need real time data uh, to help us track that all down. Uh, so that's where we're at now and uh, how we're using technology and how we might be able to use technology uh, in entirely new ways and creative ways uh, to help us move forward. 
Uh, this is great. Thanks uh, so much, Kevin, for those remarks. And now I'm just going to give a couple of questions before uh, opening it up to our uh, audience. Uh, first for you, Drew, this is actually a question from the audience. Uh, what, what share of the population do you anticipate will be on government mandated shelter in place orders in the coming you know, weeks, let's say June 1 or July 1? What's your, what's your hunch and, and how are states going to think about whether they're lifting things too soon? Uh, you know, Georgia's getting criticism, as you mentioned um, uh, earlier. Um, how are they going to think about this? Well, most are. Um, I don't recall the actual number. We actually have it uh, on our website, on our tracker. Um, so you're seeing particularly some of the red states, some of the southern states begin to open up. Georgia's the one in the news, but it's not just Georgia. Um, we don't usually take positions. I don't know if it's a position or a public health comment, but you know, I think it's risky. I think it's a mistake. I think most people in healthcare and public health do. Uh, it's also a little odd. I don't know why you'd start with massage parlors and so forth, but um, who knows? The um, uh, one thing I would say about that that I'm particularly worried about is. Um, People could draw the wrong lesson about what's happening in a place like Georgia, or at least draw conclusions prematurely. Because as they open up, uh, if there is a spike in infections, then there will be a lag before we see uh, people become infected, people show symptoms, deaths, and that could take a little while. Uh, and so it's possible that some folks will draw the conclusion that things are going okay when they're not going okay at all. It'll take a little while to really see um, what the implications are of what's happening in Georgia, in Tennessee, uh, and in South Carolina. But if you had to guess shelter in place by June 1, would you say most of the country is still in shelter in place? Well, I think so. You know, it's partly whether you look at states or whether you look at populations. Um, it, increasingly, we're seeing, to me, a kind of ugly um, red state, blue state, Republican, Democrat, and independent divide on this issue um, with um, just Republicans m more anxious to open up, less interested in sheltering in place for longer periods of time. You know, I can only take it for only so much longer. You don't hear that as much from Democrats and Republicans. We'll have some data out on that very soon um, in the next few days. Um, Texas is important. We'll see what happens in Texas. So it kind of depends whether you're counting people or you're counting states, but um, uh, you know, they're, they're, this is up for grabs right now, and a lot depends on leadership. And so uh, we have, and I don't particularly mean to be critical of the president at this moment, but you know, we're not seeing leadership on that issue, just the opposite. Uh, we don't have a president who's wearing a mask, and so you know, that has an impact on the people who follow what he says. Right. All right. Okay. Question next for, for Kate. Uh, Kate, so you talked a little bit about the financial impact that this is having on hospitals and people deferring care, and that's potentially leading to a big drain. You look historically, the healthcare sector is the one sector in the economy that was to a large extent recession proof. But do you, uh, what's, what's your sense, you know, seeing what you're, given what you're hearing about the effects on hospitals and other healthcare providers, do you think that will not be true in this recession? Yeah, so that's a that's a great question, and um, I appreciate the reference to the earlier literature that showed that you know healthcare was you know seemed to be indeed recession proof. Uh, I think this economic downturn, at least in the short run, is a little bit different, and it's different because the contagious you know nature of the disease, you know, the cause of the recession. Um, 
and you know the rec- the the effect that that has on people's healthcare use. So I think in the short run, um, the healthcare sector is not going to be recession proof. What's going to happen in the longer run? And don't pin me down uh, on what I mean by short versus long. <laughs> in the longer run. Um, there will be some interesting dynamics, right? And one interesting dynamic is, well, you know, how much how much pent up demand will there be for healthcare? Another way of putting that is all those services that we saw people not use now, how many of those will come back, right? So some people will just delay their care um, and, you know, they'll go in and, um, you know, seek those services later. They might be a little bit sicker and, you know, that's, that, that's a problem. That's, those are the types of things that we worry about. Some of those services will probably go away. They're services that um, you know people won't um, you know won't delay. They just you know never used, and you got better, and you, know, you realize that you actually didn't need to see the doctor for that reason. So I think you know what happens you know say uh, in next year's for next year's healthcare spending and healthcare uh, premiums will really depend on how the you know people are referring to it as the post surge surge uh, shapes up. Right. So, you know, how will people respond? And, you know, that will depend, that will kind of determine uh, whether uh, healthcare in the longer run really is recession proof or not. Mark, uh, you know, just to kind of ask, maybe weigh in and ask Kate some questions. You know, one of the things I've been focusing on is a bit about small business, right? So, this has been unbelievably catastrophic for small businesses. Small businesses are about half the commercially insured patients in the country. Uh, when I talked to Blue Cross recently, they're not sure people are going to pay their premiums. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, underlying factors that, that might make this very different than the last time would be the impact on small business. Uh, and then for the people who do have insurance, you know, they have a high deductible health, a uh, third of the market has a high deductible health plan. And so are they, do they have the resources even to come in when they have insurance? Um, I think those are two things that we didn't have in 2007. 2008. We did see a drop in actual utilization during that time period, you know, maybe to get some of this out of pocket issues. Uh, but the idea that employers themselves are not going to be able to contribute to premiums is, uh, is relatively new with this one. Yeah. I mean, I think that is, um, you know, that's important. And that is uh, really why um, making sure our safety net programs, which are now Medicaid and the exchanges are, are, you know, robust and, you know, kind of doing their job, right? So if, if employers lay off their work, small employers lay off their workers or go out of business, we really need to move people into um, Medicaid or exchange coverage, um, you know, for which they're eligible. So I think that will be an, an important part of the, uh, of, of the response. Yeah, we're going we're to mount whatever effort we can to try and measure not who's lost insurance, but who remains without insurance when all is said and done. It's mm-hmm. technically not going to be easy to do, but it's really going to be critical. Mm-hmm. One, one more little thing, Mark. You know, it, 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 it's pretty, um, most hospitals, um, their financial driver of success at a hospital is commercially insured patients. So the other whammy here is that the people that we're talking about that are transitioning from a private program to a public program are the profit center of these hospitals. So even even if people did have coverage and it was public coverage, it would be still a pretty substantial hit to most uh, big healthcare systems. Great. Uh, uh, Yeah, Kevin, a question for you. Uh, What do you think are going to be the key factors in determining whether we, as we get back, maintain a flattened curve or we sort of have a resurgence uh, that sort of strains or overwhelms current medical capabilities? Yeah, I think it's, it's kind of too, Drew's already alluded to the really the critical importance of how do we understand what's going on? What do we, what's the prevalence of this in the market and how do we track changes over time? And so there's a lot of effort going into thinking about how we would do that. How could we use testing responsibly? Um, yeah, as a way of just tracking prevalence and tracking changes in prevalence. Um, and then other ideas on the healthcare system side, uh, if we're going to be in this, you know, assume a vaccine doesn't come until two years, not one year, and, and we want to keep this slow, you know, um, rather than this halting kind of, uh, you know, back and forth, 
uh, can we think about flexibility and, and Nigam Shah has been talking a lot about this. How do we build flexibility into the healthcare system side? So maybe we keep the San Mateo Convention Center uh, as a spare COVID hospital. And so if we get some of these modeling wrong, or if we see a spike in cases, um, we don't have to shut down everything. We have a, a, an outlet. Uh, so it's a little bit on preparedness on the delivery system side, uh, coupled to a much greater emphasis on the public health reporting side. Great. Okay. Thanks for that, Kevin. Uh, Drew, I think a question for you, but uh, Kevin or Kate, you should feel free to weigh in too. Uh, some recent evidence suggests that the, num the number, the true number of cases of true number of people infected with COVID uh, may greatly exceed the number of confirmed cases. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what you think the policy implications of that are. A study out of Stanford, for example, suggested 50 times, 85 times higher in terms of actual cases versus confirmed cases. Yeah, Kevin may have more to say about that, but you know, um, it and the study uh, was yesterday out of LA as well. Um, anyway, uh, it means the um, death rate may be lower than we thought it was. I suppose that's good news. On the other hand, um, I don't think it means anyone can take their foot off the accelerator uh, because we don't have a treatment, because there are many um, population groups who are at real risk, and we all know um, who they are when we don't have a vaccine. Uh, so, you know, those are data we critically need. I, I don't know that it exactly changes the situation from a policy or a people perspective, but I'd be really interested in what Kevin thinks of that. Well, you know, at some level, Mark, uh, this, you know, we, we could debate about what the actual number is, but it's no surprise that testing yeah. is not the prevalence, test positive, right? So we didn't have any capacity to test anyone for a long time. You know, we've only had testing at Stanford for like three or four weeks. And then we only used the testing for people who came to the hospital when we first, uh, when we first evolved. Um, so what we were testing for was virus. Um, and now we're beginning just this week to have blood tests to see if people have been exposed. Uh, unfortunately, those tests are not regulated. So the FDA is in response. Uh, FDA in the, uh, is basically thrown open the doors. Anyone in the, anyone in the world can market a test in the United States, a blood test for uh, coronavirus, and they don't have to submit any data to the FDA until three weeks after they come into the market. And so the market's now being flooded with poor quality and counterfeit, uh, or not just poor quality or crap testing. So we're muddying the waters yet again. The, the specific study, you know, the weakness of the study was, at least up here, they recruited out of Facebook, uh, even with a random study, the, uh, the number of cases is really small. You know, we're still talking about one or two percent of the population. It might be much higher than the number of people who got a test, but it's still an incredibly small proportion of the population. So, ninety-eight percent of your population is still at risk. Um, but, but if you ask me if I want a test, well, if I was really sick a couple of weeks ago and I couldn't get a test, and now I can get a free test, I'm pretty likely to come in for the test. If I'm otherwise healthy, I'm going to stay at home. And so, just a couple of cases of uh, of people that were, you know, of selection would throw off these numbers dramatically. So I think it's still very, very early. Either way, even if you took the most outlandish positive number out of these two studies, right, you're still at 4% prevalence. That means 96% of the country has not been exposed. So uh, that's, you know, to Drew's point, that's, that's the major take home message. I also think all of this has profound implications for the American people and the pub public health messaging. It just confuses people. So they hear one thing every day at the White House briefing. Then they'll hear about this study or the Santa Clara study or some other study, um, who they actually trust, according the, by far the most, according to all of our surveys, are the CDC and Fauci, neck and neck, by the way, the CDC and Fauci. Um, and they hear a different thing from, well, they don't hear much from the CDC, but from Tony Fauci. And so, you know, you can just feel for people. It, 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 it must be really terribly confusing to, for people to just figure out what are the facts and, and what actually is true. And then a governor decides to open up massage parlors. So what actually is true? Right. It's a real challenge. 
Uh, yeah, I, so I, I, I think I, I just want to add that I, I do think that um, understanding the prevalence of uh, infection in the population is incredibly important. And I think this is exactly, you know, the kind of studies that we need to start doing. And I think that this, you know, particular study has really kind of, um, you know, it's been like public peer review in real time, right? So we've, you know, been able to really, you know, think through what these, you know, studies should look like and um, identify some of the tensions as, you know, Kevin just talked about with the existing tests and how those are going to affect our estimates and how they'll affect our planning. So I feel like this is the, you know, the first of, um, you know, hopefully many studies that are, um, you know, representative of the population that we can use to start doing the types of planning that, that Kevin talked about. So Kate, uh, next question for you. And by the way, if, if you're in the audience and want to ask a question, feel free to email jmhuber at stanford.edu. Uh, you had alluded before to the possible health effects of people staying out of the hospital and some preliminary data from other countries indicate that the number of the excess number of deaths is substantially greater than the number who are dying from COVID-19. I think we're at right now in the US 42,000 deaths from COVID-19 uh, so far. But do you think it, there is a hope of trying to uh, estimate what those health effects are and to try to get care to people who are foregoing it, who need it? Um, yeah, so I, I think that, you know, that there are, you know, several interesting things going around, right? So we, um, you know, first we want to think about, you know, these excess deaths and whether they are, you know, deaths from other causes or COVID-related deaths that are not kind of coded as such, right? So we'd have to think a little bit about that. Uh, we definitely want to think about, you know, the extent to which we have higher mortality rates for other conditions due to the lack of care. The other thing we have to think about is we will have um, lower mortality rates likely, and I think there's preliminary evidence on this due to many fewer traffic accidents. You know, folks have also talked about um, you know, pollution, you know, fewer deaths related to um, pollution in the environment. So, um, you know, I haven't uh, designed the study that will disentangle all these uh, these effects, but um, I'm sure we will have a robust research agenda, you know, to try to work on this. Um, I do think it is incredibly important to start thinking about people who are delaying care um, for uh, in, in fear of, of contracting COVID if they go to see their healthcare provider. You know, many people have very serious healthcare conditions and those delays can be really important, right? So um, I would, you know, think about that as a focus of for healthcare providers, for management purposes and for policymakers. Great, thanks for that, Kate. And we're getting uh, close to the end. I have a question for either uh, Drew or Kevin, which is, can you um, talk a bit about what you think the current bottlenecks are that are slowing the provision of needed medical supplies? Go ahead, Kevin. Ventilators and whatnot. Yeah, this is a really complex question but at the end of the hour, but, um, but basically the argument I've been making is that, um, you know, we, we have a supply chain that's not accountable. Uh, so the supply chain is not accountable for the cost, uh, sorry, is, is really predicated on low cost. Uh, we've seen this a lot in the generic drug industry. We've done some work on the economics of that, and this leads to shortages. In, we had shortages of generic drugs for years because the, uh, the supply chain is just focused on price and not quantity or quality, including the quality of the products that are available and this, the ability to have a robust supply. So I think there'll be a lot of work to go back and see, you know, Apple's responsible for their supply chain. If they make a choice to have suppliers in three markets, they're accountable to the public for making sure they can still deliver an iPhone. No one in healthcare was accountable for the fact that everyone in the world decided to make all their masks in China. Uh, and I think that's, that's a huge problem. And it reflects the lack of basically a focus on cost and no concern for quality in this supply chain. So, uh Drew, I think I'll just add, conclude with one more question for you, which is when we uh, first planned this event, we were going to talk about the U.S. presidential election. <laughs> and I'm curious to hear 
your thoughts about, uh, you know, things have obviously changed a lot since we first uh, uh, settled on, on doing this. Uh, what do you think the implications of this are for the well, Okay, uh, I'll be brief and I'll be basic. <laughs> the, um, first of all, the election's all about Trump. I, I know we see health care at the top of some issue list, but it really is all about Trump. Um, and after some kind of uh, the typical modest, uh, more modest than typical crisis bump that he got in the polls, uh, it is sliding back to uh, the mid 40s or the lower 40s, depending upon what polls you look at, and the upper 30s for independents who are really important in um, in the battleground states. This is decide. Don't look at national polls. This is decided in in states and in battleground states. Um, just to keep it simple, he's seems to be losing his two strongest arguments that he's the living embodiment of the greatest economy ever. Um, and uh, that with Joe Biden as the candidate and not Bernie as the candidate, he is um, America's protector against socialism. But, you know, November is a long time away in um electoral politics, a lot depends on what actually happens first with the economy and also with the epidemic, and they are totally intertwined now. So I do not think, I just do not think a president can shift responsibility to the governors um, if the economy is stalled and thousands of people are still are still dying. I think it's really just that simple. Uh, it, it will still be close, but I think those are the central factors. Wonderful. So with that, it looks like we're a minute over, so we should probably wrap up. Uh, and I'm so grateful uh, to you, Drew, Kate, and Kevin, for making time for this event, sharing your expertise with our audience. And uh, yeah, and I hope to uh, see you in person very soon. And for all of you in the audience, thanks so much for joining us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. Great to get the team together. Yeah, great to.